Those who are familiar with this channel and know what we're all about would have known yeah, from four or five days ago that there was no way such a great Kenyan as the late Hilary Boniface Ngueno would pass on. And we failed to say something on this channel. They would have known that that can never happen. You know, we Kenyans have a very terrible ailment, a disease, and I have no idea how it's going to be cured. And the disease has come out very clearly in recent times. When another Kenyan called Chris Kirubi, a businessman, passed on, if you compare the hype and the interest and the chatter over the passing on of Chris Kirubi, with that of Hilary Ngueno, you will understand what this disease is all about. Let me be brutally blunt. Kenyans will never care about you if you don't have money. Period. You can do great things for the country called Kenya. But if you're poor, Kenyans are not interested. In my opinion... Journalist and publisher Hilary Ngueno was one of the most important political figures of the country called Kenya. And when we get to the end of this video, you will understand why that is no exaggeration. So let's start this story at the beginning. Yeah. Hilary Ngueno was born to the late Maurice Onyango in 1938 in Nairobi. Now, the young Weno grew up in what we know today as Mudurwa, in the staff quarters yeah, of those who worked for the railways at the time. But from these very humble beginnings, the big turning point was when he joined the prestigious Harvard University in the United States. Now we have never been told the story of how a boy from Mudurwa manages yeah, to get into Harvard with extremely high fees, limited scholarships especially at that time, and especially for people from black Africa. Because nobody has told us the story, how it happened. But we also know, because this was before independence, that this was around the time that we had the Tomboya airlifts to the United States of America. That included people like the late Barack Obama Sr. And of course we all know that the United States would never have had a president called Barack Hussein Obama had that airlift not happened. No way. Others were the late Professor George Saitoti, a one-time Vice President of Kenya, and many others. But Hilary Ngueno was the very first Kenyan to be admitted to the prestigious Harvard University. And he studied, not journalism, nuclear physics. Now, just to be clear, those airlifts were for gifted Kenyans to get an opportunity to go to university in the United States. And of course, Kenyans went to various universities. Yeah, don't get me wrong. The late Professor George Saitoti did not go to Harvard. Now, the following story has hardly been told. One of the people Hilary Ngueno met at Harvard University, who was destined to have a very huge impact 
on his life was the Aga Khan, who was a fellow student and of course went on to establish the Daily Nation in Kenya in 1963, years later. On returning to Kenya, Ngweno ended up as a freelance journalist, mainly for the Daily Nation. Now get this picture clear on your mind. At the time there were very, very few educated Kenyans, black Kenyans, yeah, let alone university graduates. So, although the Aga Khan launched the nation to target indigenous Kenyans, the masses, majority of the staff, virtually all the journalistic staff at the nation at the time, were Mzungus, Britons. And so nine months into the job, a shocker, Hilary Ngueno, is appointed editor-in-chief the first black African Kenyan to be appointed editor-in-chief of the Daily Nation. And of course, all the people he's dealing with, all the people who are giving him stories to consider are Mzungus. To be honest, I don't know what the Aga Khan was thinking making such an appointment here yeah, because it was not realistic. And I'm not talking about the abilities of Hilary Ngueno. Indeed, on the surface of things, it was the perfect choice. Because if you want a paper targeted at the indigenous masses, an editor-in-chief who understands those masses having been part of it would be ideal. But then this was Kenya getting out of the colonial York. Anyway, bearing this in mind, it is an absolute achievement, a miracle, that he lasted on the job. 18 months. But I believe it must have had a lot to do with the fact that he already knew, he had already met the owner of that newspaper while in university at Harvard. But let us quickly skip to 1975 when Hillary Ngueno launched something that will be forever associated with him, which of course is the weekly review a weekly news magazine. I belong to the weekly review generation, and I'm sure there are many on this channel who belong to the weekly review generation. It was very clear from the onset that this political weekly was modeled very closely yeah, to the United States' very popular international magazines at the time. Time magazine, and Newsweek. Hardly surprising when you consider that Ngueno himself studied in the United States. But the ingenuity in this particular publication was how it was adopted into the Kenyan system so that it became a very Kenyan political weekly. But right from the beginning of the life of this weekly political magazine, there were problems. Indeed, the magazine struggled for survival in its first few issues. Quality, well-researched articles and the kind of journalism that had never been seen in Kenya before. But no readers. Kenyans hardly knew about it. I believe the magazine had produced only about three issues and were already on the brink of bankruptcy, thinking of shutting down, when something happened in Kenyan politics that changed everything. And that was the murder of the popular Nyandaura North legislator, Josiah Mwangi Karioki. That story not only saved the weekly review from extinction, but gave it the critical yeah, that helped that particular weekly survive for many years after 1975. Remember, this was during the Kenyatta presidency. The mainstream press, the mainstream media, were terrified yeah, of carrying such sensitive stories or even carrying enough details on such sensitive issues. 
this particular void in the market at a time when Kenyans were hungry for information on JM was filled by the weekly review. And there's something else very important for this news magazine. It advertised the weekly review in a way nothing else would have advertised it. And Kenyans instantly sat up and started paying attention to this brand new publication by Hilary Nguyeno. Now on several occasions before on this channel, I have told you that one of my main textbooks, yeah, under the tutelage of my late political lecturer teaching me politics, was William Shakespeare's Julius Caesar, the play. But then the staple and my main textbook was the weekly review. You see at the time, yeah, there was hardly any political analysis in the country called Kenya. How do you analyze politics when most of the issues you want to analyze are too sensitive to publish? And indeed this explains why Hilary Nguyeno's first venture into publishing yeah, was a humor magazine called Joe. Because you see when you have humor, a humor magazine talking about politics, the chances of you being picked up yeah, by the special branch in those days were virtually nil. Yeah. How do you pick up comedians for something they said about politics? <laughs> Till there are those Kenyans who got the message, yeah, read between the lines of the humor, to understand a lot about Kenyan politics. And Joe magazine was a very popular magazine of its time, maybe the most popular of its time. But Nguyeno must have gotten restless, yeah, and that's why in early 1975, the weekly review was launched. And for over a decade, this news magazine covered every important political story in the country called Kenya. It raised awareness, political awareness in Kenya, like no other publication has ever done. The unique analytical style of the magazine trained very many journalists and no doubt helped uplift the journalistic standards in the country like nothing else has ever done. Many times, Buana Ngueno's freedom, and even his life, was at risk, which should not be surprising. I guess that's what happens when you're blazing the trial, you're a pioneer, in a field that is already deadly, very dangerous for journalists. And that is trying to get to the truth in politics. Many times the weekly review received phone calls, yeah, ordering them to withdraw stories, yeah, mostly cover stories they had intended to publish. They received threats. Nguyeno himself tells the story of a time when he missed detention without trial by a whisker. And it wasn't even a local political story. Yeah, it was just a story that claimed that the government was about to recognize a socialist, communist, new African government, that of Angola. Indeed, President Jomo Kenyatta had already given the order for Hillary Nguyeno to be flown by helicopter to Nakuru to explain a few things to him in person. I don't think that was a friendly explanation that was expected. No way. It was the kind of meeting where Nguyeno may have ended up in detention indefinitely. This was a time when the Kenyan government was extremely sensitive. It was in April 1976, yeah, just a year before, there was the JM issue where the weekly review had played a prominent role in giving Kenyans enough details for Kenyans to know for sure, the government of Jomo Kenyatta was involved in the disappearance and murder of J.M. Karaoke. Indeed, in retrospect, 
anybody who properly understands the Kenya of that time would know that it is an absolute miracle that this unique news magazine even survived that period yeah, without being banned or something. But I guess one explanation is that the government feared backlash from the diplomatic community who had come to rely heavily on Hillary Nguyen's weekly yeah, to understand what was really going on in Kenya. Now, for purposes today, I believe it is important for us to try and understand why such an important, unique news magazine, well-researched articles, deep, clear analysis, managed to go out of business. Actually, the magazine was killed by the second liberation of Kenya. Let me explain. As the fight for Kenya's second liberation heated up, it introduced into journalism what I can call activist journalist with activist publications. Rather than giving well-researched neutral analysis, these publications were openly fighting yeah, for the removal of Moy from power. Their stories were clearly anti-government. Indeed, the story is told, a yeah, kind of joke, but has some truth in it, that one of the publishers of these magazines, the publisher of the finance magazine, a man called Njehu Gatabaki, used to do his research by pinning a photograph of Daniel Toretich Arapmo in front of him to get inspiration to hit out at the government in his long articles critical of the government that the Kenyan masses just loved. And from the unprecedentedly high circulation figures the finance magazine was getting, which had little or nothing to do with finance, and everything to do with the Moy must go, the kind of circulation figures they were getting, 200,000, 250,000 copies sold, very clearly illustrated that the Kenyan public were tired, were sick of analysis of a draconian government and preferred insults, direct insults, and magazines that echoed their angry feelings towards Moy and his government. Sadly, the weekly review was unable to quickly reinvent itself yeah, and find a formula for the very rapidly changing times. This is even sadder when you consider the fact that these brand new publications, these brand new kids on the block, which included newspapers like the weekly The People newspaper, would never have existed had the weekly review not existed for so many years successfully. Or around 20 years, two decades, that's a long time. And there's something else. Over all those years, Hillary Nguyen's emphasis was not on making money, making huge profits. No, it was on producing a quality, well-researched news weekly. Something that would stand the test of time. Now, had Nguyen concentrated on profits, yeah, cut down his costs, obviously affecting quality, and focused on profits, by the time this challenge came, he would have had a huge war chest of finances to chart his way forward, but he didn't. And so in 1999, the weekly review perished. By this time, of course, Nguyen had moved on into broadcast media where everything seemed to work against him yet again because this was the period when Kenya was switching from analog to digital. You know Nguyen's family is on record as having complained that the man worked every single day without fail and only rested 
on Christmas Day, the man hardly had a social life. Yeah. And unlike many other journalists and publishers who are well known for hard drinking, yeah, Ngueno kept away from the social scene. In other words, the man spent his entire life working every day very hard. And many naive Kenyans yeah, would quickly judge him and say that he ended up with nothing to show for it. But I don't agree. Because if, for instance, you want to make a list of people who contributed to the passing of a new constitution in 2010, that list cannot be complete. Indeed, that list must have the name of Hilary Boniface Ngueno very high up on it. Even yours truly, Chris Kumekucha, exists mainly because the weekly review existed. The freedom of the press we enjoy in Kenya today, yeah, although we still complain about certain draconian laws, but we are well ahead of many, many African countries. That freedom of the press we enjoy today is thanks to the bravery and the trailblazing of a man called Hilary Mueno. With all our problems and challenges of today, huge challenges, Kenya is a better place because Hilary Ngueno lived and launched publications, especially the Weekly Review. Fare thee well, gallant son of Kenya. Now, before I go, I need to quickly remind you that my very special offer to be a member of my Weekly Intelligence Briefings is ending shortly, here on the 14th. The day before Ile Moto Itawaka Kiamba. <laughs> And in the latest WIB, Moto Kuliko Pasi, we have a story you cannot dare miss. Yeah, just listen in for the details. Many times on this channel, I have described the upcoming 2022 general elections in Kenya with a Swahili very popular Kenyan expression as follows. Kimeumana kumana. Oh yes, and maybe many on this channel have not been able to fully understand what I'm really driving at. What is the worst that can happen? What can really happen? What is this that kimeumana, kumana? Really, what is it? I know many of you are asking. In my latest weekly intelligence briefings and number 60, I cover one of these areas that is really scary about our upcoming elections and it is a trend that we have seen very clearly from the last two elections the last two general elections of course i'm talking about 2013 and 2017 it is a trend that is deadly to say the least before the 2013 general elections, we had the death from a helicopter crash of the late Professor George Saitoti, who, by the way, had already announced that he was vying for the presidency of the Republic of Kenya. But was it really an ordinary helicopter crash? There is a lot of information in the public domain that suggests it was not and I covered this in great detail in weekly intelligence briefings number 60 now let me give you another quick example in the run-up to the 2017 general elections indeed very close to those elections about a month before those elections the CS internal at the time a man called Joseph Kayseri suddenly passed on from what we were told was a heart attack. A sudden heart attack just before the general elections. And then we had the still unsolved mystery of the gruesome murder of IEBC computer guru 
the late Chris Msando. In my view, the stakes were very high in 2013. They were higher in the 2017 elections. And their highest, a lot higher, in the 2022 upcoming general elections. Now, there are details which unfortunately I cannot share on this public channel that are included in my WAB number 60 that will just blow your mind. No kidding, no exaggerating. And on this channel, it is our tradition to analyze our politics in our beloved country a lot more deeply than many others do. I'm not saying we're the best. I'm not bragging. But we make an effort to analyze politics very deeply. And therefore, the analysis of this highly sensitive area yeah, must be done. Otherwise, we will be cheating our subscribers and indeed our fans and followers if we somehow leave it out conveniently from our deep analysis because it is all part of the upcoming Kimeumana Kumana 2022 general elections. Now, times are hard. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. And many of you, my beloved fans and followers of this channel, may many times feel that you're being left out because of the relatively high cost of being a weekly intelligence briefings subscriber. But I have great news for you today. For the next four days, yeah, from the day this video was published, you will be able to become a temporary subscriber for the weekly intelligence briefings for two whole months for only 9.95 Kenya shillings or $9.95. This has been the special offer for a monthly subscription, but now you can get two months. And even for those who your subscription has expired, you can now extend it for two whole months for only $9.95 or Kenya shillings $9.95 only. Go for it. I'm afraid you only have four days. In my opinion, the current special offer for a whole year and even for lifetime subscription, you never need to pay again, is also very reasonable, very low. So please take advantage. This offer will not remain forever. Indeed, it is going to end very soon. Those who normally pray for a lovely, beloved motherland, I urge you to step up your prayers concerning our next general elections. Until next time, this is Chris Kumekucha.